Reverend Rivers, I think I need to change the name of my talk to Let's Get Personal. <laughs> thank you, thank you both for that was stirring and touching and I've learned from you this morning and Emma, wherever you are, I think she left for a minute, uh, I was taking fast notes. What a magnificent woman. I am a layperson. Probably the only one here. I know that probably 90% of you are involved in the legal profession, in divinity schools, in lectures. But I'm just your garden variety, regular layperson. So how can I defend religious freedom? I've been pondering this question for quite a while. And I think it really is about being personal. I really do. I have a, a quote here of, um, let me see. Did that work? Yeah. True freedom of religion is one on city blocks and small town streets. And I, I hear all men. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> In our workplaces and our homes, it is one as people of faith go about doing good. In Philadelphia and everywhere. Right. <laughs> so let's think about that for a minute. It, it, there, is, there are some sounds in there of kind of a fight. Can you see them being one? And um, just, I think there are times when we need to, to be willing to fight or to be willing to reach down inside and say, ooh, I don't agree with this. Um, let me tell you about a time when I was, I think I was 12. It was about in 1962, around in there. And my father was a member of the board at the First Methodist Church in Alexandria, Louisiana. And he came home um, for dinner one night. Well, actually, it was breakfast the next morning. And he was, he was pondering, and he said, um, Neil, do you think we should let... Now, he said colored people, because that's what we said back in 1962. Do you think we should let colored people come to our church? And something in me bloomed. And I said, Daddy, could you stand at the door and turn him away? And he said, and, and he, I could tell he was a little, well, not know the word was ashamed, but he was conflicted. And he said, well, the board spent so long last night talking about this. Now, here's my father. Uh, an attorney and a judge who had started a home for battered women and another home for runaway youth. Um, he worked with the colored people all the time. We had people at our door on Christmas Day thanking him, leaving vegetables. I mean, we, we loved these, these people on the other side of the tracks in 1962. And yet here he was saying, do we let them in? We need to be willing to change. We need to be willing to get out of our rut of what we see as our religious freedom and get a broader view. And once that happens, one on one, a whole culture starts to shift. There's a groundswell, or there could be, that's my hope, a groundswell of a unity, a coming together, a community where understanding reigns. But it takes one on one experiences I have three, three words have come to mind as I thought about the layperson. I, don't, I know you probably feel like I'm talking down to you when really I, it's you who are emissaries and ambassadors of these things. You know this. But we need to be aware, aware of what's happening and what is needful. We need to be articulate. What is our clear message of who we are in our core and why? And we need to be active. I'll start with be aware. Let's see. Um, a, a while back, I was invited to a, a big dinner in Tennessee. And uh, there had been some wonderful meetings and such. And the final dinner, uh, we went into this big room with round tables. And I began looking for my name card. And there it was. And now, true confession, my heart sank. Because sitting next to the, in the chair next to my name card was a man with a white beard and a turban and a rather, uh, well, expressive face. But I, I even thought, could I switch with David, my husband, 
no, that would be polite. So I, I, I sat down and turned to introduce myself, and that face came alive. The eyes were sparkling, and I came to love Baldev Singh in the next hour. We started off with chit-chat, and then I said, could I, could I ask you about your turban? And he said, sure. And he told me about his faith and his belief. Turns out, we are so alike. He believed in family with all his heart. He believed firmly in his church community. He believed in feeding the poor. The Sikhs have a reputation for that. He talked about the tradition of hundreds of years of his church. I talked about my switch from the Methodist to the Mormons. Then we talked about what happens in the afterlife. There we had wildly diverse opinions, and that was okay. We talked and shared, and I fell in love with him. As the dinner was over, by now there is no fear. There is a foundation of understanding. I would support Val Dev Singh to live his religion like I'd support my own. He has a right, and he has goodness. But my first little fear could have stopped me, could have built a wall. We can't do that. We've got to break down those walls. So as we got up to leave, you know, I could use some water. I'm sorry. Let me see if I can find some down here. Some water. As we got up to leave, people are, are standing up, walking out, moving away, walking past us. Baldev takes my husband's hand, David, and he takes my hand. So, so just naturally, David and I held hands. So here we are, standing in a circle, holding hands. And he says, I'd like to pray with you. And then he looked at David and said, you pray. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to hear a Sikh pray, but, he, but it was his choice. He, he started it. So we knelt. We, 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 not, we didn't kneel. We held hands and bowed our heads, and David prayed. Prayed for unity. Prayed for love. Prayed for understanding. And then we hugged. That, that moment for me brought down some walls. But I had, to be, I had to be able to say, I'll sit by him. I'll listen to him. I'll share if he wants to hear my take on things like the afterlife. But what happened there? A network started. I, today, when I, well, yesterday when I got here, I looked around for turbans. There aren't any organizers. I, if, for all you've done, and you've done a fabulous job, I would love to, to hear from some Sikhs and what they do. In any case, it was, a, it was another moment for me, just like the conversation with my father. There is goodness in all of us. And if we can bring that together, I know that sounds idealistic, but there are ways to do it. There are ways to bridge the differences, and they're major. They're gaps. They're huge gaps. But we need to be aware. Of course, you know all of this, but if I, speaking from layperson to layperson, whoever you are out there, you one person, um, we, need, we need to uh, read up on what is going on, on what attacks there are on religious freedom. We need to form our own opinions and be able to, to share what that is with other people. We need to reach out and, and share those things, even if, even if it causes some, some, some differences. Uh, my, my, I have six brothers and six sisters-in-law, and among them, there are five attorneys, three judges, and my father was an attorney and a judge. You can imagine our dinner table. It, is, it was just like this. But um, one night a few years ago, there was a discussion about religion, and I um, said a few things about mine. They think I'm really odd. A, a Mormon is just very peculiar, and they admit they're secular. And um, I spoke pretty clearly, and then silence settled on the room. And one of my brothers, more outspoken, said, Neil, that's judgmental. Now, I don't get talked like that, too, like that by my family. But I looked at him, and what I saw was a child of God bursting forth with something that, that he felt offended about. And I said a prayer. 
Heavenly Father, help me find common ground. And I said, Lee, may I tell you that I believe with all my heart that we are all children of God. He loves us all. We are beloved. We are valued. We have good in us that we can share. We can find common ground. Now, normally this very feisty brother wouldn't have backed down. And I don't know if it was even back down. But he sat back in his chair, and there was a peace in the room. We have to start somewhere. We have to start somewhere by saying, I see your earnest desire to do what you feel is right and good. Let's talk, and our awareness starts to grow. Now, I have, um, I'm going to see if I can do this. I might need the tech man. I have a deleterious effect on all things digital. And <laughs> in fact, I was given a training once, and, and Maleficent showed up on the screen from Disney. <laughs> And anyway, I want to jump over to uh, another slide. I don't want to use these. I want to skip that. I want to go to be articulate and get there. You're missing lots of fun things, but I'm going to move on because I don't want to take too much time. Be articulate. I, I am convinced that every one of you, you've all come, you've been drawn to this, this topic for a reason. What is it? I want you to turn to a person next to you. It would be great if it were someone you didn't know, but I know that's difficult to climb over people. Turn to someone next to you or behind you or in front of you and tell them why you came today. Or it can be whatever you want. Why religious freedom means something to you. Um, why it's important to uh, build a bridge of understanding. Would you do that right now? I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. I want you just to turn to someone, maybe if you don't know, and share. I came because of you. Thank you. I'm praying for you. You're doing great. Obviously, everybody just has big smiles for you. It doesn't even matter what you're saying. They're just like, we love her. It doesn't matter. Just keep talking. <laughs> well, we can act like we're sharing. Why did you come today? You came because of you. I came because I, of you. I came because I was assigned. <laughs> so then we're here. And Let's stay up here it. for just a second. How are you feeling? Oh. You're doing great. How much do you like, have? How much time do I have? I left? know. I know. How much? Okay. Oh, y'all sound like my chicken coop. I, I think I've let the, the horse has bolted. I'm never going to get you back now. <laughs> oh, thank you. Do you want me to sit down? Just a minute. Thank you for sharing. I feel like the horse had bolted. We're trying to gather you back. Uh, this is my son, Wesley. In fact, he just came to hear me. I said, why did you come? He came running up to say, I came to hear you. But while he's up here, I'm going to use him as a visual aid. Oh, boy. <laughs> Wesley is 29. He's handsome. He's smart. He's a college graduate. He's doing entrepreneurial things. He's a people person. And he was doing well. And he decides to run for city council of Provo against an incumbent that everyone loved that did a good job. How'd it go? I lost. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm going to put him on the spot now. Wesley, why did you raise your voice and in in, in run for office? Oh, boy. I, okay. I'll go quick So because you, you guys want to hear her more than me, let's be real. But um, I, uh, I ran because I feel it is really important for us to be involved, for us to be bold, and to go out and share your voice. And, and I think that's probably the purpose of this conference is that you have a great thing to share with people and your example of religion and tolerance and as she's talking about being aware and articulate, you have an opportunity to truly be bold and share your religion with people 
in a loving, kind way. And I think that we all have something important to say, and that's why I ran, is that I, I wanted to help the city of Provo and um, raise, raise a voice for a younger demographic. And um, I lost, but it was good for my demographic to start getting more involved in politics. And um, I think that we all have something to share and, and be bold, so continue. Isn't he great? <laughs> This was a, thank you. This is a nice surprise. We had another son that ran uh, for the state legislature. He lost too. We're not losers. We aren't. But but uh, but he too broadened his horizons, got his voice out there. Um, in fact, we've got Johnny Slavin somewhere here. He ran in Dallas, Texas, uh, against. Uh, a, a powerful opponent. He also lost, but that's not the point. The po maybe it is the point. We better quit sharing who's losing. But, uh, it, but it's uh, it's important to have courage and do that. I'll tell an example of, of a small act of courage that made a big difference. A friend of mine, Joy Jones, and her husband Rob were attending a. Uh, meeting, a parent-teacher meeting with the class of parents there, and the teacher was in front. And uh, she said, I'd like to share the curriculum this year with you. And she was going down the list and came to a movie she was going to show. And Rob and Joy looked at each other and thought, mm -mm, that's, not, that's not our standard of behavior. We don't feel good about that. And they knew about the content of this movie and the language and whatnot. And, and Rob raised his hand. And in a calm, respectful, reasonable way, he said to the teacher, I would prefer that my son opt out of this movie. Uh, it is not something we feel would be good for him to view. And it's actually against our principles, the, the content of it. The teacher was a little taken aback. And as she said, well, uh, starting to say something, another hand went up, and then another hand went up and then another. And before long, Joy said a good portion, not the entire class, but maybe a third had their hands up, saying, we feel the same. The teacher, to her credit, said, it seems that there's enough people here who do not feel right about this movie. I'll remove it from the curriculum. One voice, with courage and restraint, to state their opinion made a difference for the for the class. Now, I'm sure there were some who were disappointed, and perhaps the teacher set up something for them, because we want to be able to allow differences to live. They are, they are what give us the, the uh, grit to grow and the, the impotence to learn and to stretch. We're not trying to all be the same, but uh, one voice of courage can make a big difference in, uh, in many people's lives. Um, my son, uh, in high school was in an advanced English class and they were reading, a, were, they were assigned to read a book about Vietnam. I took a look at it, leafed through it, and it was, it was quite filthy. And it was also um, degrading. And I said to my son, David, I don't feel good about this book. There've got to be other books where you can learn the same. He said, oh, I don't know, Mom, my teacher. So I went and talked to the teacher, and, and it turned into an emotional situation. Her brother had served in Vietnam. She got teary when I told her I'd, I'd prefer that my son not read this book, but my cousin was a Green Beret in Vietnam. Could he interview him, write a research paper, read another book? No, she didn't feel good about that. What do I do? I went to the principal. I took two friends with me who agreed. And we sat down and again talked. And this time, the principal said, I see your point. I'll talk to the teacher. And the teacher stood up in class a few days later and said, there's been some uh, pushback, or I can't not know what her words were, but opposition to this book. So those of you who don't want to read it, you, c you can set up something else with me. Turned out my son had to read two books, do two papers, and he still didn't make an A in the class. So we have a price to pay when we stand up sometimes for what we believe, but it was worth it. He said it made a difference in his ability to speak out and stand up. So being articulate, which I know you are. I'm gonna move on. Oh, I need your help again. I'm sorry. I had all these slides, but I've decided, you know what? We can do without them. Okay. 
The next is be active. You are. You got in your car and came here today or got on a plane and flew. You're sitting here listening to us now. What are you going to do about it? You're absorbing all these amazing talks we've heard. What are you going to do? Well, I see you as influencers. I see you as standing in the center of a circle. What is deepest in your heart? Like Elder Whitney Clayton said yesterday, what is in the marrow of your bones? What will you not give in, give up? What is your core identity? Do you know? Can you state it clearly? Is your message clear to people? My core identity is I'm a daughter of God. I worship him. I know my dependence on Jesus Christ and his atonement for my sins. I know that my path is part of a plan of salvation given by Heavenly Father to return me to him and that were it not for Jesus Christ, I could not return nor could I have great joy, nor could I have a hope and direction and promise. But I know to the source to which I must go, and that is who I am. And from that source, I find a need and a desire to reach out and build bridges and to cross gaps of misunderstanding. And it's not easy, and there are no easy answers, and it's not completely satisfactory to anybody when we're on different sides like my brothers and I. But there is still a desire to support people's goodness and to reach out to those who need help, to bear other people's burdens. As we follow Jesus Christ, that's what happens. That's who I am. I'm a wife. I'm a mother. I'm a mother of 11. And by the way, uh, Jane, we don't have 25 grandchildren. We have 37 with two on the way. <laughs> that was, <laughs> no. But... But uh, that, is, that is where I am, and I feel right about it, and it, there's great promise in it. Where are you? What would you say to someone who asked you, what makes you tick? That's where we start. We are aware and we are articulate about who we are. And then your influence starts to spread, and it's very effective. Where does it go? Well, probably... I'm imagining it goes first to family and children, those of your blood kin. How do you affect them there? I, we have this rich opportunity to teach our children truth, righteousness, goodness, bearing others' burdens. I, went, uh, I decided that I better do something special for this religious freedom seminar, and so I got a book on the founding of America, and I talked with some of my children about it, and then I went and sat down in a circle of about six grandchildren, all different ages, and I read them some stories about George Washington, about the beginning, the Constitution. And then I said, now if we were going to defend religious freedom, how would we do it? The seven-year-old in his husky voice says, go to war. <laughs> oh, okay, that, that's one. We need to get past that seven-year-old mentality, though. <laughs> And because we can have wars on continents, but we can have wars in families, and we can have wars in neighborhoods, just wars of words, wars of feelings. It doesn't get us anywhere. It just pulls us further apart. So we don't want to go to war that way. We want to reach. We want to be able to articulate. Another grandchild said, well, um, we, could, we could understand people. I thought, Megan, would you come and give my talk for me? That's it. We can understand people. She said, we could talk to them and start to, to build this understanding of, of what religious freedom is. The 12-year-old um, said, Nana, we could pray. Wise words. So we, we have family. Are we influencing them? They're going to be our leaders in 15 years. Friends, you want to be careful, of course. You don't want to blare in and, and dump your philosophy out on someone. But in the, in the normal discourse, could we bring up religious freedom? I asked a friend three weeks ago, Julie, how do you feel about religious freedom? She said, I've never thought about it. That's where we are. It's a sleeping giant. I, had, um, I asked uh, 
my female leader in our church, the Relief Society president, if she and her counselors would come over and just talk to me about religious freedom. And she said, I'll do you one better. Let's have a meeting at the church and invite anyone who wants to come. So that night I set up 10 chairs. I, was, I thought, who would come? 40 people showed up. The talk was just like you when you were sharing your feelings with your neighbor. It was rich and robust. There were shared feelings, questions. What is religious freedom? Why do we have to defend it? Is it under attack? Well, yes, open the newspaper. And so we talked. I believe we, 300 or whatever here, can awake that sleeping giant. There can be this sense of awareness come alive and people will start to ask themselves questions and reach out to others. Isn't that what culture is? I mean, the rivers started or still are in a very small um, congregation. But look what's happening. By small and simple means are great things brought to pass. And we might be that small and simple mean that reaches out, which reaches out. So this circle of influence keeps growing. That's what a layman can do. Coworkers, neighbors, that could be sticky. My, my son uh, reads the Book of Mormon on his break in Dallas, Texas at his work. People have asked him questions. What's that about? And they're able to talk. We are constantly sending messages. Whether we speak it or act it, it comes from us. People feel it. They feel our influence. I have a neighbor who's an assistant pres Presbyterian minister. She and I talk. We go to lunch sometimes. And I called her a, a while back and said, Kathy, come over and talk to me about religious freedom. And we talked for well over an hour. She feels the same way I do, that we need to speak up. We need to share. We need to talk. We need to link arms and realize I'm for her. I'm for the Presbyterian Church. They deserve it, and I deserve to be able to have these freedoms. We just need to make people aware, and they'll all say, yeah, you're right. We do. Community, interfaith groups. Uh, David and I, uh, well, I went about a year ago to a, a mosque uh, in our community just because I wanted to see, I just wanted to understand better. And uh, this friend had told a friend of hers who was Muslim that I was coming, and when I got there, there were people waiting at the door. How did they act? Eager, warm, embracing, thank you for coming. We talked about their faith. They gave me a Koran. Please come back, they said. There is a hunger in, the, in churches and minorities to connect, to understand. We can be that bridge. About a, a, just a few weeks ago, David wanted to go. So actually, what happened is, this shows how little I know, I went on Sunday thinking I would see the, the and, and there were some groups of children learning Arabic, and I said to one of the sisters, the sisters, well, they are sisters, the, the uh, ladies there, well, aren't you, don't you have a prayer service? Oh, that's on Friday. Who knew? Friday. Okay. You know, why not? And so David and I went back on Friday. I sat with the women. He was standing with the men. And when they knelt down, he looked around. He thought, well, I'll join them. So he knelt down. And he followed their, their rituals and um, got a feel for their reverence and their depth. And when it was over, the imam, who I think was from Somalia, rushed over and threw his arms around David. Tender, yearning. We want to find community and connect. And then goodness will start to grow. What can you do? What influence can you have? I know on your professional levels you do. But what about personal one-to-one? -one? What about the small means? And then there's social media and, of course, running for office. I have a friend who put some, some things out on a post about her, her beliefs in the, in the humanity and the dignity of man, and she got trounced. Maybe it was the way she, she worded it, but nevertheless, I said, Sarah, somebody is going to look at that and connect with someone else. Goodness will come from that. And then I was going down an escalator in Johannesburg, South Africa, 
and a huge mural on the wall. And it said, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Let's go together. Let's link arms on our streets, in our neighborhoods, and listen and learn and appreciate the goodness within each other. This is personal. It is one-on-one. -on -one. And with that, if everyone would do that, the culture would change. Greater freedom would grow and understanding would deepen. Thank you.